Every time that I think that this story is over, I am proven wrong. It literally just does not end. Today there has been a new update to the ongoing saga of the dissociated V Costa lawsuit. But today it's not about the IP case, this is about the harassment case that was dropped. This was the case that dissociated was filing against Sergio Costa for harassing them, but was later dropped in order to focus on the IP case, and also because Sergio said that he wouldn't be bothering them, and he said that in court. And even though the case was dropped and Sergio was awarded £22,000, He's still not happy. So I guess you can say that this is another episode of Sergio Costa is Big Mad. He took to Twitter to voice his concerns and oh boy, voice them he did. So we do have quite a bit of reading to go through today, so get yourself comfortable, get a drink. I have this much water because I drank the whole thing after I sat down and it also has lipstick on it, but that's okay, I still have water. So get yourself something as well, get comfy, we're gonna be reading through everything. Very important legal disclaimers that I have to make first. All of the tweets that I'm going to show you today, as well as all of the documents and any other screenshots, all came from Sergio Costa's public Twitter account. He chose to share these publicly along with his full name on this public Twitter account, and the lawsuit itself is public knowledge because it's been made public both by him and my dissociated who has over 1 million YouTube subscribers. Take a shot every time I say public. Furthermore, everything that I'm going to say in this video is based on opinion and speculation, not on fact. This is an opinion. And when we get to reading all of the legal documents, everything that I say about that is based on my own opinion. I'm not a lawyer and have no legal background. I know that was really wordy, but I absolutely do have to say that because just if you know, you know, <laughs> all right? Court update, Dissociated agreed to pay me £22,000 for the harassment case, 12000 now and the remaining 10k once my appeal in the copyright infringement case is decided. I got the 12k a few weeks ago from Dissociated solicitors. Now you might be wondering why Dissociated had to pay any money at all if this case was dropped. We're gonna get into a little bit more detail about it later, but essentially this was a settlement. Now for the bad news. The Court of Appeal denied me permission to appeal on all grounds, and I'm in shock and in tears. Because when you have a decision that is so obviously wrong that nobody, including legal commentators, is able to make sense of it, you expect the appeal court to give your appeal a little more than a cursory glance. But that's exactly what happened. I know judges hate appeals. I know they hate contradicting each other. It's the same everywhere. But in the UK, they take it one step further. You don't even have the right to have a decision from an authority, say a court judgment, reviewed by another authority. In Portugal and pretty much everywhere, you have a constitutional right to appeal a decision from an authority. If the appeal is filed in time, a panel of three judges will review it. And if the decision is indeed wrong, they change it. Isn't that how it's supposed to work? Not in the UK, you have to ask for permission to appeal first. As if authorities never make mistakes, or they were so rare that you need special permission to challenge a decision. So how does it work? There's a gatekeeper judge who gives your appeal a cursory glance and decides whether it has a reasonable prospect of success. But because it's a cursory glance, the gatekeeper is likely to miss a lot. Again, I am not a lawyer by any means, but to me this sounds like a pretty normal thing to do and it also sounds pretty efficient. Instead of taking something to court and potentially wasting the court's times, somebody has a look at it first to see if there are any grounds for appeal. And I'm sure people can miss things, but these are professionals at the end of the day and they know a lot more about this than you and I do, and they know a lot more about it than Sergio Costa does, who is also not a lawyer. To mitigate this, permission to appeal should only be refused when it's impossible the decision is wrong. The probability of it being wrong has to be zero. If there's a chance, albeit small, that the decision under appeal is indeed wrong, then permission to appeal is granted. I have no idea in what scenario there could be zero chance of something being wrong. Like, absolutely 0.000, zero chance of it being wrong. Isn't it reasonable to assume that there's always a chance of it being wrong, so they're just going off what makes the most sense to them. They have somebody who's reading it, and that person decides if maybe there could be something to an appeal. And if they don't see anything, then probably the person who's gonna look at the appeal is not gonna see anything either. But this was not the test they applied in my case. Why? Sheer incompetence? Prejudice against foreigners? I have been warned that this is very much a thing in English courts. You're Portuguese, calm down. Also, this was not applied in your case because you just said that this was your idea of how they should do things as opposed to how they actually do things. <laughs> so they didn't do it this way because that's not the procedure. Not because they're prejudiced against 
Portuguese people. I did do a quick Google search just to see if this might be a thing, prejudice against foreigners. I will admit I didn't do a full in-depth research into this topic because I didn't want to, but I did do a quick little search and the only thing I could find was about racial discrimination and luckily Portuguese is not its own race. That's all. Unless Sergio is a different race and I just don't know about it. I don't know, I've never seen the man. But never in my wildest dreams did I expect what should have been a straightforward open and shut copyright infringement case to turn into this monumental mess. Neither did any of us because your side to the rest of us seemed ridiculous. And again, just opinion based, it seems like you dragged it out a bit. It's not the end of the road though. I can still make an application to the Court of Appeal or take it to the Supreme Court, and I bloody will, to the Supreme Court. He's planning to take a copyright infringement case about YouTube videos to the Supreme Court, where the Supreme Court will have to look at text messages of him clearly just wanting to shag the associate in my opinion, and then get butt hurt when that didn't work out, so. My opinion. My opinion. I will fight this until my dying breath. Even if I have to drag YouTube's ass to court so they tell these judges I didn't mislead them. Because an email from YouTube saying I followed the right procedure, meaning the judgment is 100% wrong, wasn't enough to even get an appeal hearing. So this is where I think maybe some of the misunderstanding is coming in because YouTube is a corporation and they have their own procedures. They are not a court of law. The court is the court of law and they ruled a separate way. YouTube just makes their procedures around different laws. So even if you have an email from YouTube saying that you followed YouTube's procedures correctly, it does not mean that the court of law is going to agree that these were the correct steps. English courts do better rant over. This did get posted to the Dissociated subreddit and a lot of people were pretty much against Sergio in this case and others were confused about why Dissociated had to pay anything at all. I literally can't with this. He got the majority of what he wanted and is still crying. Dude, DD rejected your advances. Get over it. Someone else pointed out, a civil appeal can only be brought to the Supreme Court in the UK if a case is of public or constitutional importance. So good luck with that. Quite likely that YouTube copyright cases don't follow under these conditions. But again, what do I know? Permission to appeal is not exclusively a concept in the UK. So I don't know where he got that from. It's just called different things in different places sometimes. I hate how he's twisting that to make it look unfair when it's actually just a fairly common process used to make sure that you don't waste the court's time, which he is very clearly doing. So after this, Sergio decided to post again on Twitter to clear up some of the things that people on Reddit were confused about. If you start a nonsensical lawsuit and then drop it without a valid explanation, you must pay the other side's costs. 22k is roughly what I spend with lawyers in the harassment case. My total costs were just north of k, but include my time as a litigant in person. As I didn't want to go through a long detailed assessment of my costs, I told Dissociated I'd take 22k. If you're wondering why Dissociated accepted 22k without even haggling, read this letter. And yes, we are going to read this letter. So it's addressed to Dissociated's lawyers and is signed by him. And first he starts off with the bill of costs, which we don't really need to go into fully for this video. But if you want to take a look at it yourself, I'll leave it in the description. Again, Sergio Costa willingly and publicly posted this himself, but it does state that the grand total is £26,393.44. And, and this is where we get into the interesting bit. This is about the cost negotiations. Your client's position that negotiations can only begin following payment of the cost order issued in the IPC proceedings is on acceptable. This is to do with the previous update we had on this case where Sergio was ordered to pay £10,000 to Dissociated. So essentially what this is saying here is that Dissociated wanted that to be paid before they could negotiate these costs for the harassment claims. And he's saying that that is not acceptable. First, the 8th December 2022 order concerns unrelated proceedings before a different court. Second, the order is under appeal and subject to a stay application. The man loves his appeals. Third, your client is well aware that the default is due to an inability to pay. Fourth, even if my county court's costs are determined on a standard basis with a typical recovery rate of 70%, the resulting sum is almost double that owed under the 8th December 2022 order. 
Fifth, half the sum currently owned under the 8th December 2022 order concerns Dissociated Limited, which is not a party to the county court proceedings. Just to clear this up, because I know this can be confusing for some people, uh, Dissociated Limited and Chloe Wilkinson are two different bodies in the IP case. Dissociated Limited is the company and Chloe Wilkinson is the person who's involved. But Dissociated Limited is not part of the harassment case that was dropped because Sergio was alleged to be harassing Chloe Wilkinson and not the company Dissociated. That is my understanding of it anyway. In summary, your client demands payment of an unrelated cost order that I am unable to pay as a precondition to negotiating the costs of these proceedings. The court will no doubt take a dim view of your client's obstructive behavior and further penalize your client in costs. Somewhat of a legal threat, in my opinion. It gets a little bit complicated after this. We get to the basis of assessment and Sergio says, your client's objections to indemnity costs are unsustainable. I will take them in turn. Your client's assertion that there was a material change in circumstances may have fooled the more gullible among her audience, but it does not stand up to scrutiny. To me, this one line feels like it was thrown in because he knew he was going to share this online. Again, that's my own opinion, but why else would you throw in a line like that? bit odd. But then he goes on to talk about the reasons why he thinks this is false, saying that he had no intention of contacting Dissociated again and had made that clear, and giving several other reasons that are quite wordy and all get around similar things. So again, if you want to go into them in depth, you can go and look at that. It's in the description. He gives nine reasons in total. The last one being, your difficulty in enforcing the IPEC cost order has nothing to do with the fact that I reside abroad, and you have failed to explain why why enforcement of an order made in the county court proceedings would be hindered by my living abroad. In light of the above, I am concerned that you are litigating in ill faith. Worse, you are litigating in ill faith against an unrepresented party. Be advised that if you engage in further deceptive or otherwise disreputable conduct, I will report your firm to the solicitor's regulation authority. So he's full on threatening to report them. I, again, am not a lawyer, don't know if there's grounds to do that, but he does have a history of getting quite mad and doing things like this, in my opinion, when things don't go his way. Like we saw in the previous installment of this saga that he fired his lawyers and said that it was all their fault. He moves on then to talk about how he was not a threat to Dissociated. It is settled law that blockable communications do not constitute harassment. The higher courts and numerous reported authorities have repeatedly made it clear that claimants must engage in self-help by blocking unwanted communications. Accordingly, blockable communications are received voluntarily and reasonable persons do not regard them as harassment. What he's getting at is that messages and emails and other kind of correspondence like that, getting those things is not harassment because you could just block the person. Your client has not bothered to block me on WhatsApp, arguably the easiest and quickest way for me to reach her. One would think that your client would have at least taken the basic step to make her story more believable, particularly after I pointed out in my witness statement and later in a tweet. Moreover, your client continued to interact with me on Patreon for weeks after threatening to issue these proceedings. Only after I alluded to our fallout on Patreon did your client feel the need to remove me from the community. Had your client been remotely concerned about being contacted by me, she would have doubtlessly have taken basic self-help measures. He shows no proof of this, so we just have to assume that that's correct. Though I do wonder, again, why this may be relevant to the current issue, because the case was dropped. He's not being sued for harassment anymore, so I'm not entirely sure why he has to make his case. Maybe he does, maybe he doesn't, but he's doing it anyway. My Patreon post of 4th of January 2021 did not tag or name your client and was not sent to or directed at your client. Messages not directed at someone or where they are not tagged cannot amount to harassment of that person. Nothing in my correspondence with your client could remotely be construed as a threat. In particular, the threat of moving next door to your client was a complete fabrication. The Instagram message to redacted concerns your client's immediate welfare and fell within the meaning of reasonable conduct under protection from harassment, blah de blah de blah. The message was not targeted or aimed at your client, a requirement for a harassment claim. This is the first I'm hearing about any kind of message, so I'm not sure what this is concerning. I don't think we'll ever find out because it's redacted, so 
that's all we have for now. Your client is a mass self-publicist and has made numerous public mentions of therapy, including the frequency and type of treatment received. Further, there was no evidence from redacted or otherwise to support the allegation that redacted was not aware of the information beforehand. I really want to know who he's talking about, but I don't. There was not a shred of evidence that I sent or had anything to do with the objectively awful email your client claimed to have received from an anonymous account. Interesting wording there with claimed to have received. Strangely, the email was never mentioned in the pre-action correspondence and your client either did not take any steps to identify the person who operated the account or did so but did not like what she found. A quick Google search showed that the account belonged to someone in the United States due to the use of a US Army reply to address, or North Africa, and then moves on again just to say that he was not harassing dissociated. Then it moves on to point three, your client's motivations. Your claim that your client brought harassment slash privacy proceedings because she reasonably believed she needed to do so does not hold water. This is a hugely bold claim. This document in itself is full of really bold claims and really big statements from Sergio, like saying the gullible audience thing. I'm sure we're going to see more of it. First, despite some of the purported incidents of harassment conducts, the previous lawyers made no reference to them. Indeed, the letter does not mention harassment at all, let alone the tale of rejected amorous advances your client would later concoct. I don't, I don't know, I saw those texts. You saw those texts. That's what it seems like to me, that's what it looks like to me in my eyes. But again, that's an opinion. I, I don't know what his motivations were. That's what it looked like. Rejected amorous advances. That is what I'm going with from now on. According to the letter, your client and I had simply fallen out and needed to resolve a copyright issue. One aspect of the letter and your client's case has remained consistent though. Your clients wish to silence me. I somewhat wish to silence you. I'm sorry. No, I'm not sorry, actually. Who am I apologizing to? First with a cease and desist letter that threatened legal action if I spoke out publicly about our dispute or the work we had done together. Then by seeking an injunction that would prevent me from ever telling my side of the story. Finally, with settlement offers that only reinforced what your client really wanted. To put it bluntly, to shut me up. I don't know if language like this is appropriate in a legal document, but... I'm sure he was tired at this point. This is a very long document. Just a reminder that there was talks of an NDA potentially being in place once we were originally talking about this whole situation. Second, as stated above, your client doesn't even bother taking basic self-help steps. Third, at all times, your client's position was that if, and only if, I pursued my copyright infringement claim, your client would bring these proceedings against me. So essentially saying that Sosted was only going to bring up the harassment claim if Sergio brought up the intellectual property claim, the copyright claim. Fourth, your client used these proceedings to pressure YouTube and me. For example, your client attempted to mislead YouTube by claiming that the injunction demonstrates that what Mr. Costa has done by removing my videos is legally considered harassment and that he has been ordered by the court to stop and that YouTube should comply with the legal order and restore the videos. I do wonder if he considers him copyright claiming all of Dissociative's videos not to be harassment. Firstly, why did he copyright claim all of the videos, even the ones from before he had worked with them? And secondly, and all of this is alleged, what about the alleged group chat that he was a part of where he said before he even started working with Dissociative that he had plans to take them down and do something like this, allegedly. How does that then not constitute harassment? I'm not a lawyer, so I'm just asking. He then goes on to talk about times where he believes that Dissociated was being disingenuous and spreading false information about him. This is but a small sample of your client's extensive disinformation campaign, which is the subject of the civil claim for defamation, harassment, and breach of privacy I am bringing against your client in Portuguese courts. This is never going to end. This is gonna go on forever. I mean, he said it himself. He's gonna fight this until his dying breath. So is he not tired? I'm tired. There is a lot more said in this document as well. It's not really necessary to read everything, but if you want to find it yourself, you know where to find it. Settlement offer. I have no doubt that my application for indemnity costs will succeed. However, I would like to bring this matter to an end and avoid further burdening the court with this preposterous claim. To prevent further litigation, I propose that we settle my county court costs as follows. 
The sum is reduced to £22,000. It is a discount of more than £4,000, and as low as I am willing to go. Your client transfers £12,000 by 4pm on the 24th of March 2023 to the following bank account. The 8th of December 2022 order is deemed paid. If I win the appeal against the 8th of December 2022 order, your client shall pay the remaining £10,000 within 14 days of receipt of the sealed judgment from the Court of Appeal. Should your client reject my very generous offer, I will initiate the detailed assessment procedure and seek my costs on an indemnity basis. So essentially saying I am willing to settle here, but if you're not willing to settle, then I will bring the rest of this to court and we're gonna have to do more rounds of this. So they settled. Let's take a break, shall we? Because after all that legal jargon, my brain hurts and probably your brain hurts too. So have some water. How's your day? Hope you're well. You know, there was a point where I had the opportunity to transfer into a law degree and I did strongly consider it, but I'm so glad I didn't because if I had to read this every day, I would absolutely jump into oncoming traffic. I just cannot do this. It hurts my head so much, but I do it for you guys. It's okay though, we don't have much more legal stuff to read. We now just have to finish reading the tweets and I have to sneeze. Sergio then moves on from this and says, as for the copyright infringement case, I may have won on infringement and given an undertaking that prevents Dissociated from using my work again, but Dissociated's counterclaim was also successful. And it was successful because the trial judge accepted Dissociated's false argument that I should have used a different procedure to report content in video description boxes. I literally have an email from YouTube saying I followed the correct procedure. Again, court of law above YouTube. That's how it works. If I don't revert this decision, the case will be deemed a draw and I won't recover my costs. Now, I don't know about you, but if I'm accused of deceiving YouTube when I literally did what YouTube told me to do and the upshot is losing dozens of thousands of pounds, I will fight it until I've exhausted all my options. My costs didn't come from crowdfunding or donations. They came from my savings and the bank of mum and dad because some of the best IP lawyers in England told us this was a done deal. I'm not wealthy by any estimation. I cannot believe that this man's parents helped him to pay for this. This is insane to me. And it does raise a couple of alarm bells and questions in my head that I probably shouldn't question here because it does veer on speculating on somebody's personal life and their mentality and whether they were spoiled children. I shouldn't question that here. But I can't imagine a scenario where my parents would pay for me suing somebody about copyright. Am I the only one that thinks that this is odd? And apparently his parents aren't wealthy either. They're also gutted by the neglect and disdain these two judges have shown for my case. So yes, I'll do everything in my power to revert the decision that anyone who gives this case more than a cursory glance can see is obviously wrong. And as to where the £22,000 came from, I don't know. The transfer came from dissociated solicitors. I'm pretty sure it's against crowd justice's terms of service to use the money for anything other than your own legal costs. If that's what they did, I'd rather return it. This is a little bit sneaky because he had no point outright says it probably came from crowd justice or I think it came from crowd justice or it might have come from crowd justice. He says, I don't know where it came from. The transfer came from the solicitors and then just state something about Crowd Justice's terms of service, which if you don't know, Crowd Justice is where Dissociated was fundraising money, which goes directly to their lawyers to pay the lawyer's fees for this stuff. I would generally assume that it would be fairly normal for the solicitor to be the one to transfer the fees. I don't know if anybody in the comments can attest to this, but I would have assumed that was just how it works. I don't know if this is normal. So ChatGPT says that normally the solicitor will not send the fees and it's the client's responsibility. However, they say that there are some cases where an agreement can be made between the client and the solicitor so that the solicitor takes care of this. So essentially the answer that I'm going to give you all is I don't know. So it seems like generally this isn't actually the common practice, but it can happen. So it's not necessarily the case that this money came from crowd justice. I'm gonna be honest with you because again, this is an opinion piece. It seems like 
this whole letter, a lot of it was written with the intention of posting it online for people to read and trying to garner sympathy and support from people who disliked Associated, because a lot of it does read that way. Of course, I can't say that that is what Sergio was doing. Uh, perhaps this is a normal legal letter to be writing. And there was a lot of information about the entire harassment case given in there before getting to the settlement offer. But of course, do your own research, read it for yourself. If you know a lawyer or you are a lawyer, then ask that lawyer or yourself, if you are that lawyer, ask ask your brain. I've been recording for an hour and reading legal stuff for an hour, so I am losing the ability to speak. So I'm gonna leave it here for today. Psych! know in the comments what you think about everything that we've spoken about today again all of this is public information and it was made public by Sergio himself I am not sharing anything that is private anyway like comment share follow me on social media I'm Vangelina Scott everywhere and please 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 if you haven't already I would really appreciate if you would subscribe to this channel it really really helps me out so thank you so much if you do that and you can turn on notifications as well but most importantly i hope you have an absolutely wonderful rest of your day and i'll see you in the next one bye